First of all, I want to thank Will and Jabe and Lean UX for inviting me to present. It's always quite surprising for anyone in philosophy to be invited by people who do real things and are real practitioners to talk um, anywhere because we're assumed to be uh, people who have no clue about what's going on in reality. Um, but what has stricken me throughout the day is how the commonalities that not only many of the talks refer to, but also the commonalities between what you guys in design are struggling with and what many disciplines have been struggling with in the last 35, 40, 50 years. It's really a, con I don't like the word paradigm shift. It's a conceptual framework that is changing and we're undergoing, we're going through the birth process. And we don't know what's gonna happen on the other side, but we have an inkling of where the problems are and where we're going. And then what I'd like to do is start out by using a canoe as a metaphor for the conceptual and cognitive framework that Western, I'll, I'll say Western civilization in general has followed and I'd like to walk you through the process. Think, and I owe this um, metaphor to Bob Artigiani who teaches history at the Naval Academy in Annapolis. But think of a canoe, right? You know, you're here on this shore and you wanna to get to that other shore. And so you ask yourself, what vehicle, what structure, what conveyance is gonna get me to the other shore? And so what you try to do is you try to design a structure that will um, get you to that other, that you can point to and that you can spell out and you can describe to other people so they can build it to and you can get to the other shore. So you might say to yourself, nonsense, we've come a long way since the canoe. Um, look at what we've got so far. I just got in from Miami Beach and the noise is deafening, but you get a lot of these on, on the beach. Uh, let me ask you a question. What do both of these have in common? What do both structures have in common? They all both assume a placid background. They both assume equilibrium structures, equilibrium background. And therefore, if you have that assumption in mind, you have stability as a model as a framework in which to work with. And stability was an ideal in philosophy, in science for many, many centuries. What is stability? Small deviation around equilibrium. So you try to build your canoe so that it doesn't wiggle and it doesn't wobble and it's, it's, it can guide you safely and directly towards your goal. Um, so therefore, stability is translated or interpreted in terms of structural rigidity or form in a very um, thing-like, box-like way. Um, I always kind of joke around and say the problem with philosophy and science is that Parmenides won and Heraclitus lost. What that means is rigidity and permanence and stability won and becoming and process lost in the history of philosophy, but that's a whole different talk and a whole different problem. But many of you have spoken about the problem of thinking that there should be a recipe or a blueprint or a pattern or a, or a look at table, but most disciplines from ethics to the hard sciences have used that, those presuppositions as their background assumptions that have informed the model with which they work. And when all of you talk about how difficult it is to tell the client or convince the client to, think, to do it this other way, of course, everybody's been assuming these kind of background assumptions. Very difficult. It's easy to change your specifics. It's very difficult to change your background assumptions. But you all know what happens when the background is not equilibrium, when the background is turbulence. This is what happens to a canoe, right? 
When it hits turbulence, you might say, well, you know, again, we've come a long way since the canoe, but how often have you heard the space shuttle launch has been canceled due to bad weather on the Cape? And what does that mean? It means, well, you know, this is a temporary setback. We'll just wait till the storm clears, and then we'll be able to go back to using the same model with the same idea. You have a nice rigid structure. It's going to get you where you want to go. And I'm not, I'm not trivializing it. Newtonian mechanics, Newtonian science, these background assumptions have been incredibly successful. It's just that we did not understand the limits of their applicability. That's been the problem all along. Now look at the difference between the concept of design of a canoe versus that of a whitewater raft. What's the assumption here? The assumption here is there will be turbulence. And what you need is what? To be able to adapt, modify, and therefore survive the rapids. Very different. It also requires a lot more teamwork. It, the raft can go sideways, backwards. There really isn't all that much difference between the front and the sides of a raft. It is designed to assume that the goal is to survive the problems. And so instead of having a stability model, you have a resilience model. And the definition of resilience is its ability to withstand perturbations from the outside or fluctuations from within, adapt to those, and evolve. And the default assumption is there will be perturbations. There will be white water. A whole different mindset, and we don't, we don't understand that. Let me, um, so I've labeled my talk Choosing messy resilience over neat stability. See, stability is prettier. Who doesn't want a nice platonic structure that you can, who doesn't want a nice platonic design that you can show? And look how neat and tidy, and the whole thing is so neat and tidy. Resilience involves a messy situation, and it's a very difficult switch over for mindset. I would like to claim that what Michael Lissack calls Science 1.0 has always been a fail-safe mindset. The goal, because of this equilibrium stability background, the goal is to create a structure that will not fail. And it has characterized Western thought since Plato. I, I could go through the whole history of Western science. That's what I've been looking at for the last 15, 20 years. Every discipline, certainly just look at economics, right, um, have followed this cognitive framework. Aim for perfection. You have to be able to discover an ideal structure, an equation. The word structure, I'm using the word structure very broadly. Discover some kind of ideal structure. Try to get as close to it as you possibly can, implement it. And the way you go about fixing any issues is you remove defects, but what you're aiming towards is a system that most of the time, 90-some percent of the time, will not fail. Now, when practitioners realize that that's not possible, then they invariably resort to a fallback position, and that is, we'll protect it against contamination and degradation, and so isolate it in some way, and that gives you the silos in organizations, it gives you the moat in Jabe's uh, fortress situation. That goes as far back as Plato. There is no utopia ever written in Western civilization, by the way, um, Asian countries do not write utopias. They're very interesting, right? Because Asian thought is more towards process. Western thought is more towards, let's set up this ideal situation and get as close to it as possible. We can't, we better make sure we isolate it so it won't be contaminated from anybody else. 
Most all utopias written in the Western world have all required isolation, moting, uh, sort of bunker down uh, mentality. And, and you see that playing out in different ways in different disciplines. Uh, what does this mean from a philosophical, if you step back a little and ask yourself, what's going on here? What's really going on in the, in the mindset behind this? And the answer is, there has been an assumption of a linear deterministic universe, that the world, that the universe is linear and deterministic. If it were, then recipes, blueprints, business plans, all would in principle work. You'd just have to make sure you set up the conditions in such a way that you could carry them out, right? It assumes, therefore, a one-to-one -one causal relationship. Do this and you'll get this output. Do that and you'll get the other output. And so therefore you get the predictability notion, right? I've always been um, fascinated by this whole, the way the Human Genome Project thing has panned out or played out because a lot of us in complexity theory kept saying from the beginning, you ain't gonna get a one-to-one -one mapping between the genome and the, the disease. You're not gonna get it. And everybody said, oh yeah, yeah, well you know you guys are crazy. <laughs> well, why? because this mindset also assumes there is no context dependence. And I use the term context dependent in a very particular way. Every, a lot of people talk about context. I don't think context is, for example, what Darwin referred to when he talked about the environment. Even in Darwin's case, he plunked the organism into the environment. That's not what I think of its context, that's kind of like a vessel you're throwing something into. P for me, context is what some previous speakers have mentioned as enacting, embodiment. You are embedding the system in the environment such that the feedback is such that it brings out all sorts of other issues. And that is, where's the boundary of a system? What is the identity of a system? Once a system is so embedded in its environment, once the designer is so really embedded with the user, then the boundary and who's doing what gets a lot more difficult to spell out and we're not comfortable with that. We're comfortable with Aristotelian categories that have nice little boundaries around them that, as, that are as rigid as, role, as walls. Um, we also have no sense philosophically, scientifically, or whatever about part, whole, whole, part relationships. Our entire notion of causality has been reduced to the notion of billiard ball, Newtonian push-pull uh, causality. And obviously, that's not the way wholes and parts work. Parts interact to produce a whole that has emergent properties but is not different from, even philosophically, you've got the whole school of vitalism and so on, you've got some kind of deus ex machina coming out from outside, but that's not really the way it should be. Parts should interact to produce a whole that has emergent properties and then, God forbid, the whole has causal efficacy on the parts. And that's the biggest no-no of all in philosophy of science, in science proper. Uh, and that, I think, makes it very difficult because in any hierarchical organization, be it an ecosystem or a social organization or a business, you have to be able to understand how those relationships work. And I chose in the book to use the term constraint because I thought that would be least unpalatable. I don't care if you call it cause, I don't care if you call it constraint, but the question is, how do those relationships between wholes and parts work? Now, what I find most rewarding is that the old mechanistic science one mindset did not allow for emergence or creativity. Any kind of change was really what biologists call development. It's the unfolding of pre-established potentialities, but there's no real novelty. There's no real evolution of, of, of 
radical emergence. Uh, but in the case, now that we understand nonlinear phase transitions and nonlinear dynamics and complexity theory, we understand that there is room for radical novelty and emergence that is causally effective. And that's very exciting, but on the other hand, because it issues from context dependence, it's uncertain, it's unpredictable, and I've always asked myself, how on earth do you make a living off of this? Who's going to pay to be told, well, I can't predict in specific details. You can predict in a range. Now, see, I have the convenience and the luxury of being an academic. I don't have to worry about these kinds of things. But, but it always surprised me because you've got the creativity and emergence, which is the nice part on the one hand, but on the other hand, the lack of specific we could predict an eclipse to this nanosecond to two million years from now, and it'll probably be okay. But that's not true even for the weather. Even as much better as weather forecasts have begun, they'll never be perfect because of the sensitivity to initial conditions, of the context dependence, and so on. And I could go on and on and on with the... Um, uh, examples from the different disciplines. I mentioned the utopias in philosophy, the human genome in biology. Uh, do you all remember Smokey the Bear? Uh, Smokey Bear, only you can prevent forest fires. That's a fail-safe mindset if you ever saw one. The assumption was, make sure you never have a fire. And then it took us a long time to figure out, hey, <laughs> that's not really, A, what's going on, what should be going on, and that's not really going to solve your problem because any fire you get is going to be 10 times worse than you had before. Um, constitutions in political theory have been way too detailed. They try to make sure they, they catch every detail and make sure they dot every I and cross every T. Engineering, that, this is the engineering mindset par excellence. It's Newtonian mechanism. It's Taylor management theory. It's um, homeland secure. I live in DC. It's homeland security, it's a, it's a lot of that, all right? And if I were to give you a picture of a beautiful example of this mindset, it's this really intricate um, refinery, right? As opposed to what? As opposed to this ecosystem, and for most of Western civilization, we assumed it was a lot more difficult to understand how to do a refinery than it was to understand an ecosystem. And it has only been in the last, what, 50 years or so that we've really begun to appreciate that the complexity is not the same as complicatedness. Complicatedness is one thing, but complexity is a different quality of uh, phenomenon. Where does complexity come from? Complexity comes from the non-linearities, the context dependence, the feedback, and I would almost argue the feed forward is even more important, the acceleration. Uh, and here, I think, is the key. These processes of that are non-linear, context dependent, that have feedback, they change the boundary conditions and parameters of the dynamics of the system itself. The, see, the environment and the context of the steel fragment can only make it fall apart, but it doesn't affect the dynamics of the process itself. And I would therefore argue context-dependent, in my sense, changes everything. And I think that's what you're seeing playing out in this room. That's what you're seeing playing out in practice. That's what you're seeing playing out in the disciplines that we're going through the transition, and as somebody said about a paradigm shift, you know, it proceeds one a burial plot at a time. You have to just wait until the old practitioners die off until the new paradigm comes in. Very often, that's all you can do. Um, but we do know that complex adaptive systems select for resilience. They do not select for stability. Right? Um, stability ends up getting killed off by the next hurricane, the next pest, the next competitor, um, the next predator. But resilience is what? Evolving 
towards greater evolvability, right? Which is something that Jabe was pointing out this morning, all right? And they enable creativity and emergence. Now, what are, can you see in the back? I'll read it out. Um, what are features that enable resilience? They don't guarantee it, but they enable it. First of all, most, op most complex, I mean, complex adaptive systems, period, are open systems. They're not closed systems. We've always designed assuming a closed system. But open adaptive systems are self-organized. They are, they are self-assembled. And at the beginning, they require what I call enabling constraints. I have a kind of a pet peeve that we do tend to use the term constraint way too often to mean only restrictive. But there are times when there are enabling constraints. There are conditions, boundary conditions, that propitiate self-organization. At the beginning of a, an ecosystem, at the beginning of a startup organization, you need access to resource and waste disposal, obviously. You need access to in, internal resources, your, your abilities, your, your skills, and so on. You need access to outside resources that will continue to nourish the system. So, and among those enabling constraints are catalysts and feedback that enable you to, to sort of begin to organize as a structure. At the beginning, though, while the boundary conditions are set from outside, you know, you happen to be set in Silicon Valley and you've got access to the uh, venture capitalist and you've got good talent and so on. But at the beginning, you're basically self-maintaining and, and you're self-repairing. You really not, you haven't self-organized. You've self-maintained, you self-repaired, and usually what organisms, and you could, I could be speaking to a bunch of biologists and it, I, it, it, that's the point I'm trying to make. Biology is the metaphor. That, that at the beginning, you're just doing what you do well over and over again. Um, I just finished reading a book by Jamie Davis and it's called, I can't remember, but he talks about how early on, early on, um, a, a, an earthworm just does it again, does it, and those are the segments of an earthworm. You just do it over and over and over and over. So replicating what you do well over and over is a very successful early strategy at the beginning of any evolving um, ecosystem, uh, living organism. But the goal at this stage is to achieve what I and some complexity theorists call autonomy, it's a special sense of the word autonomy, and that is what you want to make sure is that the enabling, that, that you get closure of these dynamical constraints in such a way that your endogenous dynamics produce the boundary conditions within which you can survive. See, early on, the boundary conditions and the enabling constraints were by and large being imported from outside, and that was fine. It was enabling you to, to sort of get a structure going. But in order to become autonomous, you have to ensure that the dynamics of the system itself produces the boundary conditions. And that was the big transition between physics and chemistry. Once you get autocatalytic structures, the autocatalytic structures like the beluzov zabotinsky reaction and so on, they, they, it's, the, it's the closure of the loop of catalysts whereby the catalyst produces the product and is a product of the process. Once you've got that loop going, then you are in a self, self if you want to prefer the word self-sustaining or, or um, uh, then autonomous, that's fine too. But at the established stage, once an organism or a species or an ecosystem or an organization is at the established stage, then it should be looking towards continued evolvability. Otherwise, again, the next predator is going to kill it off because it doesn't matter how good you were at setting up the structure in the first place under nice, stable equilibrium conditions. Once the conditions change, you're dead unless you've somehow been able to evolve that evolvability aspect. And here is where the 
part whole whole part relationship of constraints becomes, I think, very important. And Peter Allen at Cranfield University has really lovely um, paper that shows how microdiversity is one of the most important features to allow an organism or a species to survive. And that is, if you have a system level structure, it's composed of a lot of subsystems. What you want to make sure you do is that you somehow stabilize the, the macro system, but it's a meta-stability because that stability is not a rigid stability. What you have to do is allow the subsystems to continue to explore the state space. And Dave Snowden uses the term probe. Doesn't matter what word you use. What you want is to be able to, can, to have the parts of your system be able to continue to explore the state space because that'll give you the diversity that if the environment changes, you might have one of those subsystems have the skills, the features, the characteristics that will be survivable in the next, um, under the following set of conditions. I like to talk about boundary conditions as membranes, not walls. Again, the old traditional science one framework has always thought of boundaries, I said before, as walls, rigid structures. Keep the outside out and the inside in and never the twain shall meet. Paul Silliers, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago in South Africa, talked about membranes, particularly, and he uses an example, the eardrum. You know, what the membrane does, it serves as an active site, S-I-T-E that negotiates the how much input, how much output, and its role is to maintain a certain amount of integrity of the system so it doesn't fall apart, but it's not to wall it off from the outside, but to actually serve as the interlocutor, um, uh, transponder, I don't know what the word is, between the inside and the outside. Um, Buzz Holling, another biologist, always talks about how important it is that there be loose coupling between the subsystems. Too rigid coupling between among the subsystems, you get a crystal, rigid, frozen. Too loose, it's a gas, it, it, it vaporizes, it disappears. So it's a Goldilocks um, media, uh, in between, too loose and too tight, and that has to be appreciated by management or by the by the systems level as to what is the environment I'm in so that I can allow more or less dynamism in my subsystems. Obviously, we have replacement of organs, but organs can go awry and do their own thing, and that's called cancer, right? So it's a, you don't want it to be rigid, you don't want it to be static, but you don't want it to, you know, go on its own either. And so it seems from the point of view of biology and ecology that the role of the top higher, the level of the hierarchy, its manner of influencing the part is more that of a catalyst and a regulator and a modulator. And lo and behold, that's what they're deciding, that's what genes do, right? That the genes don't determine one-to-one -one characteristics or diseases, but rather they serve as modulators as when will this one activate? When will that one not activate? So it's, it's a catalyst regulator modulator model, not a top-down command and control uh, orientation. And biology figured that out. The US uh, military figured that one out a while ago. I was always amazed when I first moved to DC how, how interesting that DARPA and the, the US uh, military appreciated this very early on. If anything should be a command control structure, it should be the military. Well, they, learned, they figured this one out a long time ago. And it's only now that certain disciplines are figuring it out themselves. And the problem with modularity is that at some point as you grow, you have to modularize certain um, uh, achievements that the system has accomplished. Keep it as a sort of a institutional record or memory that stabilizes a process, 
but you don't want to do it in a way that you silo off everything and that, that ends up um, choking the system off. So these are some notions that, that we know from ecosystems theory, from um, biology in general, that enable resilient uh, systems to, to, to survive. And so it, if I were to summarize what I want to suggest is that you've got a f one fail-safe mentality of direct uh, rigid structure to get to an end, and the other one is a very loosey, messy, um, but we're starting to visualize the details of how ecosystemic structures work, and if anything, it seems as though the biology metaphor is beginning to replace the physics and the engineering metaphor, but it's going to take a while because it's messy, it's not neat and tidy and pretty, uh, but that's, I think, where we're going, but we can't see the, we can see the end of the tunnel, but we can't see the other side yet completely. Thank you. <laughs>